Well, hello, everybody, and thanks for uh, joining us today on our inaugural uh, Information Governance Initiative uh, Google Hangout, our vir virtual event. So we thought we would try this technology. We, we use it internally, and uh, we participated in various other ones, and it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit bleeding edge, so you might have to bear with us um, as we try this technology. But we think it's uh, a cool idea to, or, or, you know, a great platform to... Uh, potentially have a just an organic discussion about uh, a topic um, as opposed to the more structured conversation that you might have on a webinar. So thank you for joining us. Um, if you have any questions throughout our presentation today, you can see the chat uh, box over on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, use that, and we will uh, answer your questions as we go or perhaps throw your question out to the panel. So um, let's, Maribel, if you could just go to the to the first slide. Let me just start off by introducing who we've got with us today briefly. Uh, later I'll ask them to kind of introduce themselves and tell us who they are. And, but, you know, initially I'm, I just wanted to say that I'm just really excited by the panel that we have here today. We've got a great conversation lined up. Uh, if the technology works and holds together, we'll be, <laughs> we'll be in good shape. Uh, but we're going to talk today about information governance steering committees, and, and I can't think of a better group of people to uh, have that conversation with. We've got Bennett Borden, who's a, a co-founder with me at the IGI and chair of the IGI. We've also got Sue Garrity, who's an information governance uh, expert who has worked at, uh, who's built information governance programs at a variety of organizations, and we'll, we'll hear more from her about that. We've got Ed Halleck, who drives uh, product and product marketing at RSD, and then Rich Kessler, who uh, runs information governance at UBS. So uh, we'll, they'll introduce themselves to you in a second. Um, before we do that, let me just set up the conversation a little bit first. Let's go to the next slide, Maribel. Um, the goal uh, for today is to have just an organic discussion about information governance steering committees. You know, we hear in the information governance initiative community all the time and through you know providing these services and interacting with people who are trying to solve information governance uh, this is one of the places that everybody starts and it's a logical place to start you very quickly realize when doing information governance that it's a multi-stakeholder pursuit and so the next logical thought is well alright so if there's all these different groups that I need to talk to that need to be part of the discussion then I need some kind of you know way to have that conversation and to bring those people together uh, for that conversation. So uh, that's what we're going to do today: is have a discussion about folks' experience with putting those groups together. We'll talk about their um, who should be on it, what does it do, what's its mandate, what's the operational cadence. In other words, how do they actually uh, uh, do stuff? And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be a great conversation. Um, so let's just flip over to our panel, uh, Maribel, and start off with uh, just introductions. So, Bennett, why don't you uh, tell us just a little bit about who you, who you are to kick us off? Thanks, Barkley. It's uh, great to be here. Um, I am currently the chair of the information governance practice at Drinker, Biddle, and Reef, um, as well as being the co founder and chair of the uh, IGI, which is something I'm very proud of. Um, you know, I've always been in the kind of information leveraging business, trying to figure out stuff. I came out of the intelligence community before I went to law school uh, and have always been about trying to get information out of information and helping companies do that. Um, the really great thing about information governance is, is once you get a company greater access to its information and the ability to leverage it for um, both compliance purposes, but really for business purposes, it's amazing what transformations happen in a company. And so helping companies do that is something I spend most of my time doing now. And uh, why are you wearing a suit and tie today? That's the biggest I question. I actually had to, I know, see, Barkley knows me. I never wear a suit and tie. Um, <laughs> but I actually had some really important meetings this morning that I just got back from. So I didn't have time to change into my T-shirt like I normally do. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't dress up just for us. No, of course I did, Barkley. <laughs> <laughs> I can go next to Sue. Th thanks uh, for that, Bennett. Uh, Sue, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, um, what you've been up to in the IG space? 
Sure, Barkley. Um, I, I'm actually a former, what I would call a former practitioner uh, out in the industry. I, uh, I've had experience uh, implementing records management and information governance programs in, uh, in financial services companies and uh, uh, auto suppliers. And so based on my own experience struggling through those, um, I, I, I really got a, a an enthusiasm for helping others do that. So, so I'm actually currently uh, an independent consultant, uh, helping companies do just that, like understand how to set up an IG program and and help them through some of the roadblocks and, and stumbling things that you can come upon. So, and what's is that? You know, so if you think about your clients that you're working with right now. I mean, do you find that most of the market, most of the people you're talking to, are kind of at that stage that they're they're just trying to unpack information governance and figure out how to get going with it, or, or what do you see? Yes, exactly. They're they're all in all the ones I've talked to so far are really in the in the very early stages of of even trying to understand what it is and and what's their first step. What do they need to do? Right. Interesting. Uh, Ed, uh, or can you hear us? Are you there? I think I see you there. I, I am. I am here. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah. I can hear you just fine. Now, are you? You're wearing. Looks like you're wearing a Christmas sweater, and you have a Christmas tree. No, no it's actually a golf shirt. I, I took off my t-shirt. I, you know, <laughs> like 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 that. I, I I put on a golf shirt. There is a Christmas tree in the background, partially decorated. So yeah, you gotta uh, you gotta get after that. We got ours decorated last night, finally. So. Yeah, it's on the schedule for this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ed, why don't you introduce yourself to us? Tell us a little bit about your background in IG as well. Sure. So, um, I, I'm Ed Halleck, obviously, uh, with RSD, and I uh, I run product marketing for all North America and most recently Asia Pacific as well. Um, and uh, for the last couple of years, I have been really out there in the market on behalf of RSD, kind of advocating the need for information governance trying to understand really um, what the, what the organizations are struggling with in terms of trying to put governance practices into place. And we've been trying to help them, I think, uh, from both an education perspective and a technology perspective, kind of define what really needs to happen as this yeah. market is developing. So when you're out there um, talking to customers about products and IG, are you encountering a lot of committees uh, out there? Is that who you're presenting to, or what? What are you, what are you seeing? Yeah, I, and I think that's actually one of the challenges we've seen, right? And that is that who really owns this responsibility in organizations? From from yeah. executive level, who owns it? And then underneath that executive, kind of what are the what and who are the key stakeholders that need to comprise openly that committee that's going to drive an information governance program in an organization. So. We've talked with record, you know, with, with with lead records managers. We've talked with general counsel. We've talked with some CIOs, and, and I think that's still uh, as committees are forming, um, folks are still trying to figure out who should be part of that and who should drive. Yeah. yeah. Well, excellent. Well, happy to have you here today, and thanks to all our panelists. Now, uh, and I think Rich is having some technical difficulties on on his end. Let me just check. Rich, uh, can you hear us? Uh, looks like he's uh, he's dropping off, so uh, must be an internet connection problem. So hopefully he'll be able to join us uh, as we go because Rich has been doing some uh, very interesting stuff uh, in maturing kind of corporate governance around uh, information governance at UBS that hopefully he can tell us about. All right, well Maribel, let's flip to the slide uh, with the questions just quickly. Uh, I just wanted to set up our conversation a little bit with some of our research that we've done at the IGI on this topic and just you know use that to kind of help frame our discussion so you know the slide you can see is just some of the questions we're gonna we're gonna walk through and I think these are the key questions for anyone uh, wondering about an IG steering committee or trying to start one or put together a charter uh, for one of them so uh, we won't, I won't promise that we'll get to all of them but you can see kind of where we're heading uh, with our discussion today so Maribel, let's go to the next one. You know, we, uh, as, as uh, many of you may have seen, earlier this year we published what we called our annual report, which was a 40-page research report 
uh, just dripping with infographics about the state of uh, information governance from a conceptual perspective. What is it? What are people thinking about? How are they defining it? From the perspective of what is it as a market? What are people spending money on? What are they doing? And then from the perspective uh, of where are people going and what does the, the work uh, actually look like? So uh, I just wanted to share a few slides or infographics with you from that research. The one that you see up on your screen is uh, we've taken to calling this the flower or the wheel internally at the IGI, but th this slide in, a, in a, a quick visual I think encapsulates the reason that we need a uh, IG steering committee. You can see around this wheel we ask people, well look, I mean, what do you think from a subject area perspective, what do you think is part of information governance? And it's a long list. And I would expect that as time goes on and the IG market matures, of course, that will narrow and we'll start to get a, a more solid understanding of, of what it means from an execution perspective. But looking at the state of where we are now, this the graphic in and of itself says, look, we need to be talking to these people. In some cases, we need real input from, from them. Sometimes we need decisions from them. So how are we going to do that? Uh, next slide, uh, please, Maribel. Uh, the second one of four that I wanted to show you is an infographic where we asked practitioners and then also providers who are selling products and services uh, to them, delivering them, you know, what are you doing right now in information governance? And so you can see updating policies and procedures, you can see data consolidation and so on. And there in the number four spot at, at about 50% is implementing some kind of new corporate governance structure for information. So it's certainly part of the mix of projects as Ed mentioned. Uh, and Sue that uh, organizations are working on. And on the next slide, which I think is, is really interesting, is we asked folks, well, uh, if you could, if you had unlimited time and money and budget, what would you be working on? And you see define and implement a corporate governance framework is right at the top of the list. So practitioners understand that uh, this is something that's critical and the governance of, of information governance itself is essential to its success, um, which is interesting. And then the last slide we had, which I won't talk uh, in, in much detail about, but um, you look into it and take a look at it because we, we asked some pretty detailed questions around, okay, aside from a steering committee, you know, what would you actually, how would you actually structure the governance around uh, IG in terms of a responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed uh, structure? So let's start our discussion. Um, ben, I'm just curious for your perspective. Let, let's start with the basics. You know, what is an IG steering committee and what is its mandate? What's your experience there? You know, the idea of an IG steering committee <clears throat> comes out of the idea that, like on the first slide you showed, is that IG is really a coordinating function. Um, in my experience in many years working with companies, I have found that a lot of the projects they do around trying to create and use information are limited because of kind of the siloed effect of the different stakeholders, what we call the facets of IG. You know, e-discovery cares about one thing and security another and privacy another and IT another. And they're sometimes overlapping, but many times they aren't. And so each of those functions or facets tries to, to take charge of the information it creates or, or take care of the information problem. And they, they do that about the things they care most about. And so as far as an overarching information strategy, it becomes limited. So the idea of an IG steering committee is how do you solicit these very important voices from the different facets of IG and properly balance them to, to accomplish the objectives of your company? And to figuring out how to get those voices at the table and elicit them well um, is really what the IG steering committee is all about, in my experience. Right. So, Ed, um, just to follow up on that, when in the life cycle of an information governance program do you think practitioners should start to build one of these things? It's it varies a lot by company because you want to be very careful about when you put a committee in place because it's important to get these voices around the table and solicit them and balance them properly. But you want to also have the right people at the table. And you want to be able to um, act fairly quickly once the group gets together. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes you're trying to 
Um, figuring out where to start, or figuring out what your mandate is. If you have fairly well balanced, uh, uh, the different facets for well balanced in your company, you can get this group together fairly quickly and early on in the process to even figure out what their mandate is going to be and how they. Um, but we have sometimes found it's good to do a bit of work and to figure out kind of where the maturity in the company is before putting a committee together. Um, because if you pull the trigger too quickly, you can sometimes stall the inertia instead of forwarding the inertia. So, Stu, in your experience, both you know, as a practitioner inside organizations and now advising companies, what what do you think of that? I mean, is it is it uh, should this be the first thing that people do, or where does it come in that cycle of building out a, a program and capability? I think it needs to come in fairly early on. Um, because if it doesn't, and I, I agree with Bennett that, that there needs to be some sort of uh, review and analysis of, of the maturity of the company and where, where they're at. But I think if, you, if a company waits too long to set up a steering committee, then it becomes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm in a hotel room, so I apologize. I'm calling from the steering committee right now. See, I thought I had everything covered. I forgot about the telephone. Um, so I, I think if, if a company waits too long, then it becomes um, something that only one aspect of information governance, only one department is pushing, for example, the records department. Yeah. And I think that then once that perception is there, it's, it's difficult to overcome that. It's a great uh, and point. it's then difficult yeah. to get the right people at the table. So I think it's it's a balancing act. I mean, Ed, what have your most successful customers done in terms of introducing this concept into their IG capability? Where does that fit in from a well, maturity perspective? Well, I think kind of what Bennett pointed out is is true, and that is that some of it depends upon the, the maturity of the organization and, and maybe in some cases the vertical industry that the organization is part of because I think that the practices tend to be a little bit more um, disciplined and, and maybe um, pursued at, at, a, at a greater uh, uh, velocity for those organizations that are in very heavily regulated industries like pharmaceutical industries for example and so they tend to I think because they're operating in business environments that involve a lot of regulations and a lot of discipline, tend to be a little bit more structured in their approach. And so they've, right. they've, they've understood the right people and the right, I think, departments that need to be pulled together as part of that. And as a result, I think they're probably out in the forefront a little bit more successful in terms of understanding who really needs to partake or who needs a seat at the table and kind of yeah. need to drive it. Whereas yeah, makes sense. I, think, I think organizations that are less less regulated vertical industries struggle more with when and who and how. Uh huh. Right. Yeah, there isn't that, that powerful driver necessarily to get this done or to, to build it into the existing governance structure. Um, Rich, are, did I hear your voice? Are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Hey, Barkley. Uh, so, great. So, Rich, um, you know, where did where did you start to now? I mean, I know that your your overall structure around IG is is much more extensive than a single steering committee. But I'm interested in, you know, when did you start to inculcate that concept um, in building your program, and then what happened from there? I mean, what what's worked for you? So Barclay, it uh, definitely occurred early on in the process, as was yeah. pointed out just a little bit earlier. You know, in regulated industries, there are legal and compliance drivers, of course, but often there is an event which drives the creation of the steering committee. And uh, yeah. you know, it wasn't an event in terms of an external event, but it was an internal event that raise the awareness amongst the senior managers that specifically did become some of the steering committee that alignment was necessary uh, around a particular project that just happened to cross several different domains. 
and started out as being, let's say, focused uh, myopically on one of them. And as a result of really rallying uh, the folks that would become a good part of the steering committee around that, uh, creating an education process uh, around that, we were able to take that one, let's say, um, body of work and use it as a use case for addressing the entire IT and business change environment, uh, meaning that it was important not to address one or even two, et cetera, uh, IG facets, but it's really yeah. um, an eye-opener to start looking across these different domains. So that was really the basis for and the evolution of the uh, steering committee. So, Rich, when you think about the, uh, the flower graphic that you know, I showed earlier, of all the various facets of IG, you know, when you think about that and you think about the kind of representation you have in your information governance committees, can you break that down for us? I mean, what what are the, the, the relevant facets, you know, for you and your program? Uh, so the relevant facets include uh, records and information management, e-discovery, yeah. data protection, privacy, information security, compliance, risk, uh, and corresponding IT elements. Um, often in uh, regulated industries such as financial services, there's an emphasis in the IG function and the breakdown around uh, what I would say is control functions. Uh, ideally, an IG environment would be also built to, let's say, factor in the business, uh, more of the business uses of data. So that is, you know, a, a place we're headed, uh, and very quickly. Uh, but uh, originally, the steering committee started with what one has to do with data, as opposed to the facets which reflect uh, what one wants to do with data, such as business right. analytics to drive, um, you know, profit growth, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, Stu, so, you know, one of the things I'm curious about and I'll probably ask this of Rich as well, but, um, you know, we like to sort of blithely put IT on the list of facets. But, of course, as we all know, there's really no such thing as IT. There's, you know, a bunch of people working on different aspects of a bunch of technology at a company. And do you have any advice or insight into, you know, well, who from IT or what kind of people or what section of IT, do you want to get involved in a steering committee? That's a great question, Barkley. Um, oh, thank you. And, and, I, <laughs> and I find that many times, um, you know, for example, if you talk to the records and information management folks, they may not even understand all of the different uh, groups that are, that make up the IT department. And so, yeah. um, one thing I, I think you it, that you need to do is really involve the CIO, maybe not necessarily to be on the steering committee, but to help guide what what aspects of IT do you need. I mean, obviously, IT security. Um, many companies have uh, an IT quality group. Perhaps you want those folks on there. You want um, somebody on there that can speak to the the storage aspects uh, of of IG. You know, near near yeah. term. You know, yeah. active storage, inactive storage. So, so I think the first step um, is to get the CIO to assist in in identifying those those areas that you need. Yeah, interesting. Uh, any any further thoughts on that from the panel before we move on to another question? Yeah, you know, this is Ben and Barkley. You know, this is two, a couple of really good points that were brought up here. Is that you know, when Sue talked about part of the purpose of the steering committee is to get buy-in, right, so it doesn't feel like one part of the company owns it. The whole point of this IG effort is to coordinate and synthesize these um, functions. And so getting these the various functions or facets of IG involved is also winning hearts, right? By getting their buy and getting what they care about and what they are concerned about and getting Do 
Did we lose Bennett? I think we did. It sounds that way. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. sure if he just dropped out for me. He was so, about to say the most profound thing ever about <laughs> IG steering committees, and we lost him. <laughs> well, let's so move I'll on to the... If well, you I want, think Parker. Yeah, go ahead, Rich. Sorry, I just wanted to mention, you know, uh, first of all, I agree with everything uh, Bennett was uh, saying, uh, but just to get back to your earlier point, uh, I think it's important to have a CIO on your steering committee because so many elements of IT um, uh, become relevant when you're looking at, uh, you know, information governance broadly. It's, it's really difficult to narrow in, narrow in on just one aspect. And as your program evolves, it may start with, architecture and engineering, for example, within IT, and then evolve into IT risk, and then IT infrastructure once you get to the implementation side, for example. So as senior right, and IT right. representative as you can get, um, you know, that that's ideal. Uh-huh. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I think this is one of the interesting challenges about uh, IG and what it, you know, just to set up the next, qu the next question is that you know, even in a world where we have a chief information governance officer, which certainly we are, are, you know, trying to do our part to give birth to that because I do think it helps to solve a lot of the corporate governance problems here. Even in that world, you know, information governance is never going to be um, like a, a vertical department like sales or what have you that, 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 that does its thing kind of in its corner and integrates with the company in a few different ways. Information governance is always going to be primarily a horizontal activity that needs to be embedded into the business in all kinds of ways. And so I think that begs the question, you know, what kind of authority, you know, should an IG steering committee have? I mean, what do you see with that, Ed, with your customers? What, you know, do, do they, is it, is it just a, a group of people that get together and have coffee and talk about IG? Do they have, do they control assets? Do they have an approval role as it relates to policies? You know, what have you seen with your successful uh, customers here? So I, th I think, I think the, the folks have been successful that those steering committees, um, key stakeholders, whatever you want to want to call them, have been kind of empowered to understand and encapsulate the business requirements and translate those requirements into the policies that the organization really needs to govern the information it has properly. Right. Um, now, 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 can they cross that line from policy to enforcement? I don't know, because I think, I think Rich hit on a really good piece, and that is that I think every one of these committees I've seen has struggled with how to engage with IT. Um, and, and, and that's, I think, probably one of the biggest challenges is is because the enforcement is going to take some technology, of uh, the enforcement of the policies. And how do we cross, I guess, that chasm to get the steering committee engaged effectively with IT? It's been one of the challenges we've seen. Sue, what, what should the, yeah, that's interesting. Sue, what should the uh, authority or, of a steering committee be? Do they need real authority or what, you know, explain to us how it functions in the corporate governance environment. Well, I, I, first of all, I, I think having a corporate information governance officer really is going to be the next step. You know, I think, yes, we can set up a steering committee, but um, I, like, I, I would agree with Ed that, the, that it, would, it is going to have Limited authority, you know. If you if it if IG is not recognized uh, at the same level as you know compliance or risk, I I think we're we're going to struggle uh, as an industry to try to really move IG to where it should be. But in the meantime, um, I I think this if the steering committee has the right players uh, and they're at a high enough level. You know they they can get some things done. Obviously, they need uh, a, a mission statement. I mean, what's what's the purpose? What what do they see the future of IG at the company? And then I think the next step is to is to take a look at at policies and procedures and and uh, evolve them into uh, 
covering information governance as a whole. So, you know, I, I certainly don't disagree and, uh, about, you know, as, you know I, I'm highly invested in the idea of the Chief Information Governance Officer, obviously, I, but, but I also think that, I mean, I would want to caution practitioners against believing that, you know, of course, that's going to be a silver bullet, and of course, that's not what you said, but to right. tease out from that to say, you know, this is the discussion we've had a lot internally at the IGI as well. Okay, well, you have this C level position, but what is that, that person's ultimate authority? And you can make an argument that, well, look, I mean, who, this, this I think is a really interesting question that we should talk about is, you know, who really has authority in the corporate environment? And there is this illusion, I think, that anyone with a C level title has some kind of major authority. But you take, for example, a CFO. Yes, a CFO is a powerful position, but does a CFO control a huge budget? You know, do they actually dis determine how money is spent? No, they don't. They serve at the at the pleasure of the CEO, and they service the business. You know, everyone says, well, you know, look, the CIO has a huge budget. Well, that is true, but how much of that budget is driven by the desires of the business? So, who really has the power there? There's an infrastructure level that the CIO has an independent budget for that has nothing to do with business. But there's these other huge chunks of money that are tied to business applications. So, you know, the mechanism of power and the mechanism of, of authority, I think, is right at the heart of this discussion around the steering committee. I mean, if the, you know, look, if this is the world doesn't need another committee, you know, it needs what we need is a mechanism to to really make information governance work. I mean, Rich, from your perspective, you know, tell us about that. I mean, because you know, you're in a very large, complex organization and what you know what is the currency of authority or power uh, in an organization like that well I'll talk about what it ideally would be and um, and then talk about why <laughs> it uh, you know there are various realities uh, that we all have to deal with but you know I, ideally the steering right. committee would have power and authority over any data in the company where it resides how it moves around uh, when it's gone to speak to it high level, which means they'd ultimately not only set the policies, and, and it's not that they would necessarily have to execute on the, all these things, but they would have the authority and or the accountability to ensure that these things are in place. For example, a control framework that corresponds to a policy to ensure that data is being managed appropriately, life cycle wise, normally and out of course. And that's not a holistic, that's just one slice of what they need authority over. Uh, so in other words, for a specific example, uh, if a system or a platform is going into place, it serves the business, but it is not addressing compliance with respect to your control function IG facets, it shouldn't go into production. Yeah. Uh, conversely, you know, if right. it's and, and then decisions need to be uh, made around that. And um, so often that is the case. And, uh, you know, uh, it's a matter of once you establish IG, getting your organization lined up so that can always occur every time. So ideally, I think right. that's, that's the setup so that they really have the authority they need to ensure the defensibility of the policies that are established. By. Right. Well, and, and I think that that's a great insight, Rich, and, and to, like, we, we have to, you know, be sophisticated in our thinking about this in the sense that, you know, often this conversation sort of begins and ends with the idea of, okay, great, we've got a committee, or, you know, in a perfect world, I have this C-level executive, but again, you know, how is authority, how is, you know, manifested in an organization, and you're describing building the information governance uh, cons consideration of information governance, information governance requirements, building that into the business process itself. So a new application is coming in to the business. Does that application meet our IG requirements? Uh, if we build that into the onboarding, the provisioning process, that's a that's real authority. You know, and an authority that doesn't. It's not magically coming from somebody with a huge stick, right? You're building it into the business process. I think that's a, a great uh, insight. I mean, Ed, w when you think about your customers, you know, what kind of authority 
you know, do you see in these steering committees? Like, for example, I mean, I guess a, a real question, do any of them actually, do they buy stuff from you? Or how does that work? Do they make recommendations to someone else? I mean, what happens there? Yeah, I mean, I think they're certainly influencing the buying decision. And I think, yeah. I think the critical factor is whether we call it a chief information governance officer or whatever we call the executive sponsor in the organization, if there is one, that gives some legitimacy to the steering committee. Otherwise, that steering committee is, I think, as you said, Barkley, they're just meeting around the table having a cup of coffee and chit-chat because yeah. – Without that sponsorship, the perception is they're not empowered to do anything, and and I yeah. think that's that's kind of that, that's really what it comes down to is if there is a sponsorship, that committee then has, um, for the most part, I mean we've seen cases where they've actually been involved directly in the buying decision. So, uh, yeah, I yeah. think that's, yeah. that's what makes it work. Interesting. Yeah, um, just a reminder to um, those of you who are attending live. Um, if you have questions, use the question Q&A chat function to uh, pitch us some questions. We've got a question from Mary, which is a, a great one, and one I wanted to get to, which is, you know, if, if you're if you're doing this, building this new committee, I believe it's a, a good idea, obviously, to leverage existing corporate governance structures. I mean, this ha this will ha you know, unless you're a, a ten person company. This committee will have to live in an ecosystem of, of other similar groups. So, uh, Sue, any thoughts on that? You know, where would be a good place to kind of plug this in from a you know committee, council, board uh, perspective at, at a larger company? I'm not sure I understand your. What do you mean by where would you plug it in? Well, I mean, I guess you know a lot of companies. You know, for example, there, there's a there's a process for approving anti money laundering uh, policies. Yeah. For example, there's a board approval process that uh, any high level corporate policy goes together. So there might there's you know typically a whole structure, an organization of roles and responsibilities underneath that. Uh, there's committees. There's you know so on and so forth. So. I guess the question is: Is there, a, you know, have you seen at any organizations a, a natural fit um, where you might, rather than build this completely independently, not plugged into any of those processes? Is there a place to, to kind of plug it in? Uh, okay. Uh, in in my experience, um, those committees have been built independently first, and then. Uh, there's been okay, and, and now where can we plug those in uh, yeah. and, and interact with other committees um, that might align with different aspects of, of IG? So, so in, in my experience, the the committee came first. You know, it wasn't an outgrowth of another committee, or um, even though you may pull people from other committees to to bring them into an IG committee, it it, it would yeah. really depend. Yeah, I mean, we we just did a project with the bank, and, and they they built all of the IG committee and subcommittee work into the audit function. They had a, a very high powered group that um, already met every month to deal with a set of issues that was narrow enough and on point enough that you know plugging in IG issues was kind of a natural fit, and that really greased the wheels of implementation. I mean, Bennett, what have you seen in terms of where this committee would fit in that layer of corporate governance. You know, I have seen it in a couple of different ways because the the key to this is that you want to get the function out of the committee. If you, sometimes you are uh, converting over what a, a prior committee used to do, like sometimes you've had an informal working group like Mary mentions that gets kind of promoted into this IG steering committee. The thing you have to be careful of is is that effective? Because you not only bring in um, the good parts of prior committees, but the bad parts too. So is there um, a dysfunction or is there a reputation? Um, does Is it seen as an IT group or a RIM group? Um, so you have to consider those things. But you certainly want to leverage any strengths you have. One of the companies we worked with had um, kind of an IT solutions group 
that was trying to understand the different business needs of different units inside oh, yeah. of the company and interpret those business needs into kind of IT effectuation. And that was co close enough to what we were trying to do with IG that we used that structure. They already had some funding and some, um, some uh, momentum. And so we used that to broaden it into these larger IG areas. So the key is to use what you have and the strengths that it has, but just be conscious that there may be some negatives in that as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, Rich, you know, in building out your your group there, I mean, I can't imagine that you know UBS is the kind of organization where you know you're going you you know you're you're going to kind of create something off on your own ultimately, right? I mean, just like Sue said, it might start that way, but ultimately it has to integrate into a decision-making structure that's in place. I mean, what did what what have you done there to kind of leverage those pathways that already are, exist? Yeah, so as Sue said, um, in my experience, uh, often you're building uh, something with unique individuals or unique roles. Uh, often this occurs because the, well, let's say the existing uh, steering committees at your firm don't necessarily have the uh, experience, the expertise, the insight to even really get IG, so to speak. You have to start yeah. with the folks that are senior, senior enough to, to get it. Uh, but what I was going to say is, uh, and then plug in to, as was said, you know, existing uh, committees, which in our case is uh, largely the areas of uh, legal risk, compliance, and IT. Uh, however, I would say in uh, building an IG, let's say, steering committee from scratch, and whether you're looking at uh, doing that or leveraging an existing committee, as high up in the company as you can go, in terms of right into the board, if you've got a mix of people that do that. Um, uh, it's power, influence, and control over money, risk, and compliance, and the business itself. If I could simplify yeah. it to like three things, why you're in business, number one. Yeah. For example, data quality as a driver. Who's going to benefit from data quality being good? Who's going to really you know, be able to control the funds around that? Who needs to worry about whether any of that activity is going to be compliant or whether there is a, you know, from a risk perspective, a balanced approach to it? Those are the folks that you want on the steering committee. And just a quick example, if you had somebody in your organization, if you had two people you were looking at, let's say arbitrarily in IT, Who's, who's the person that was able to get $100 million for their project versus the one that was just turned down within the last six months and is wondering, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. that's an obvious example, but uh, sometimes it's not only within the function that you're looking, it's actually who specifically you're picking. Well, look, I don't think that there's any shame in being somewhat, uh, well, being savvy or even mercenary in some ways about getting this stuff done. I mean, that's what it takes in a in a in an organization. It's you know, there's, you know, as I just wrote, you know, something saying that look, we make you know, we make all these decisions in information governance for for every reason other than you know logic, and that's you know the, the reality that we're against up against in in trying to change any kind of corporate behavior, IG or not. Um, so yeah, I think that makes sense and is, is good good advice. But let's try, uh, I got a, I have a few questions here uh, in a lightning round. So you can, you, you, there's no deliberation, you just have to give me an answer. And uh, you know, it's a little uh, nerve wracking, frankly. So I'm gonna start with you, Bennett. How, how, how big should an IG steering committee be? It should be the- How I many people? Goldilocks principle, right? So I think anywhere from 8 to 10 is pretty good. When you start getting too few, you get less buy-in and you get less of the voices. Um, if you get too many, it starts to break down. Now, there's two caveats well, to that. You're going into deliberation now. No deliberation. All right, just enough. That's, <laughs> oh, no, wait, I'm a lawyer. It That's depends. Good. That's right. Uh, right. It depends. Okay, Ben's answer is it depends. What about Ed? <laughs> What's your answer? Uh, I, I I kind of agree. It's, it, it needs to be it needs to be big enough so that you get the right level of collaboration, but not too big because you know more, the, too many cooks in the kitchen it doesn't get done. So I don't know if there's a hard number. Eight to ten sounds like a reasonable number. Six to twelve, somewhere in there. Ten. Okay. Good. Sue, how many? Uh, you know, I was going to answer eight to ten. So nice. Good. With no with Great. no caveats. Great. 
Really? I'd say as uh, few as possible, but uh, I would say, you know, if you're able to get things done with the group that you have, great. And if you're not, it's time to reevaluate whether you have the right number. Beautiful. So, Ed, back to you. Uh, who should run the steering committee? Who should be the boss? Oh, that's a great question. I wish I had. A, I wish I had one answer for that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think it might depend upon kind of what's the discipline of who the executive sponsor is. Maybe that's going to cause the leader to emerge from that group, but I'm not sure. This isn't not another it depends answer, is it? My goodness. <laughs> this is all we're getting today. <laughs> all right. Well, fine. Fine. It depends, right? Good point. Bennett, let me guess. No, see, so this one I actually have an answer for. So the person <laughs> in charge has to either have these things, three things, or access to these three things. They have to have the understanding, sorry, we call it the ears to hear, the eyes to see. They have to have the money to pay for it and the authority to do something about it. That's where you want the, the leadership to lie. All right, that was definitive. Do you want to revise your answer now, Ed? No, no. I was afraid Bennett was going to say the legal team had to lead it. <laughs> <laughs> that would, we don't want that. Even if we're not in charge. <laughs> that would be a disaster. Um, Stu, what are your thoughts on who should lead this group? I think it, it should be the person who is perceived to have the most clout in that particular company. Yeah. So that the, yeah. Uh, so the chairman of the board? Whoever on your steering committee has the most clout, in the, yeah. yeah, so that the so that the steering committee has some clout. Rich, so I have a very specific answer. I think somebody who and uh, it'll be a little bit comical, I think, but somebody who reports up to the board that doesn't have the golden parachute of the other C level executives. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we need someone who's a little bit of a whippersnapper here. <laughs> someone with the power and authority, yet in independent and right. access to the money. Well, maybe it should be like you know, in Canada, the, we have a, you know, there's a national police force, the RCMP, and I, I think they've stopped doing this now. But they used to, they would, they would give you a posting, and they would force you to rotate every two or three years, so you didn't get too comfortable in that community, which they felt led to corruption. So maybe we should have something similar in. Uh, in IG. Okay, well, those are good. So how often should uh, the steering committee meet? Uh, back to you, Bennett. I have found uh, more often at the beginning, because usually we like to start an IG steering committee with figuring out their projects and putting a plan together, because you need more attention at the beginning. But then I found that quarterly usually works pretty well once you get the process going. Yeah. Uh, anyone else on that one? Thoughts? I would yeah, I would agree with that. That at, once it's a mature program, then quarterly would be fine, but certainly more more often in the yeah. beginning. Yeah. Ed, what what have you seen? I would I would agree, and I would, I would think quarterly would be once once kind of the program was really well defined and in place. Yeah. I, prior to that, it's got to be more frequently. You know, very frequent at first, and you know maybe weekly, monthly up until that we're really at a point where where we're established. So let me throw this question at the panel. Um, we, we, we got a, a question in from uh, from David. You know, has the recent increase in cybersecurity incidents created more of a spotlight on board uh, support for an IG steering committee? Have you seen anything there, Rich? Uh, in, you know, is um, I mean, I mean, every day it seems like somebody probably in your organization is opening up the Wall Street Journal and going, "Okay, the world's changing here. What do we do?" Is that, do you see that affect your area of the company? Uh, I would say not directly yet. I would say yeah. indirectly across, um, let's say, financial services for sure, but I'm yeah. sure any large firm. Uh, indirectly because, uh, especially if, uh, let's say, cybersecurity or information security is part of your IG program, that is going to get a lot of emphasis and um, even more so than uh, this year, let's say next year, and uh, right. that indirectly will uh, perhaps strengthen the power of your IG program because it's going to help if it's structured appropriately. Your cybersecurity team, for example, reach its objectives while doing other things. Right. And wasn't there, Rich? Uh, I think it was the SEC or maybe Finra that issued a few weeks ago 
uh, a piece, uh, not regulation, but um, a paper, I think, on that very issue of, you know, cybersecurity issues kind of need to move to the center of a consideration at the highest level of management in, in, you know, in, on, the, on Wall Street. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we've all seen evidence of that, of, um, you know, following the news. Yeah. Uh, I'll leave their name off the table. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no uh, name. You know, very large bank was, was uh, you know, just in the news for that. And that, of course, yeah. um, has triggered a, let's say, a, a tactical and a strategic response yeah, yeah. Broad, broadly in financial services. So, uh, for sure, and then there's been several regulatory, you know, responses, papers, Letters that have gone out, yeah. um, you know, trying to raise the not only the awareness but the level the the level of investment and attention. And if, are, are people picking up the phone and calling you guys because of security issues, or how does that play in your market? Um, and not not so much for security issues. I, I I think there's this perception now finally that that the security is part of information governance. Where I think that uh, for a long time. Folks are looking at cybersecurity and, and securing information kind of independently from how they were governing it. And and I think, you know, the events that have happened, they will continue to happen. I read somewhere recently, I think they, they said ninety seven percent of companies are vulnerable to, to some type of cybersecurity attack. And and here we are sitting December eleventh, and this is normally the time of the year when we, we see the most of them, I think. Um, right. And, and so I guess we're sitting waiting for the next big one, but I think that does raise the awareness yeah. for to start looking at what do we need to be doing about governing information and how we secure it, not just internally but you know externally from a, from a uh, access perspective. Is that and should that be part of our information governance program? Right, right. Um, so just a reminder to people who are watching live, if you have uh, additional questions, please throw them out there. We're, we're coming up to the end of our session. But the one thing I wanted to make sure we talked about was, you know, how do IG steering committees break? You know, what is the, the dysfunction that we find uh, in those committees? Where do they kind of go off the rails? And I know uh, Bennett and I do kind of a fun exercise uh, at the IGI boot camps where we do a mock steering committee and try and, uh, act out some of these, and it's a lot of fun. But you know, Bennett, just give me your kind of top dysfunction that you see these committees suffer. Believe it or not, I think it's having the wrong person in one of the slots that you need. Um, you know, if we talk about the IG steering committee, is where you have representatives of each of these important facets that you can figure out what they care about, what's really important, right, and then balance it. And if you've got the wrong person in that slot, it's worse than not having the person at all. Um, and you can have the wrong person on two kind of axes. One is um, that they just don't represent the voice well, that they really don't understand what that function needs. And then you've got to spend your time developing that voice inside of your company. The other is if you don't have the right personality, because IG is all about consensus and cooperation and trying to really get down to what the business need is. What is the business objective? Um, it's not a good place for turf wars or turf battles or um, you know those kind of personalities. And so choosing the person is really critical uh, to fill the slot that you have. So panel, jump in on that. Um, any, any other thought? I mean, what have you seen? Any examples of you know changing the names to protect the uh, guilty, of course? Um, uh, examples of dysfunction, or what, what do you think is the most common kind of places where these groups break? So I think it's the second point that Bennett touched on. It's really alignment, right, of, yeah. of stakeholders. And, and I think, I think that I've seen the most break with alignment with IT. Maybe it's not the right IT person or people that are engaged, or maybe it's just that that the perception of the rest of the committees. Uh, committee members and stakeholders relative to IT is very different than what IT's perception of what its role should be in there. Yeah. So that, that's yeah. where I've seen, I think, the biggest disconnect. Interesting, yeah. Rich, what, what do you see there? Uh, generally speaking, you know, the alignment, I think, is the is the key word here. I'll, I'll bring it up from a different perspective, though. When one, let's say, uh, steering committee member's uh, self-interest, performance targets, domain becomes uh, so important that 
the uh, fight against the alignment, quote unquote, what's best for the firm because right. they're really they're letting their self interest get the the best of them. And usually when that happens, it becomes obvious uh, to other steering committee members. So if you have a steering committee member like that, uh, best thing to do is go to the, all the other ones and uh, basically try to ensure your outcome comes out in a way that's best for the firm. Uh, right. But I but I often see that because that is a key, you know, a, a unique challenge to IG. You're trying to align all these independent interests and agendas and uh, trying to get everyone to win. That's not always possible. Right. Sue, so thoughts on the dysfunction? Yeah, I think uh, alignment is a key and also um, the leadership of that committee, um, you know, to like everyone else has said, it's difficult to bring all these different factions together and have them feel like their interests are are represented and, and considered and, and to lead a, a committee like that is a difficult thing. So you have to have the right person in that in that position. Right. Interesting. Um, we're, we're coming up to, to our last few minutes. And one thing that I wanted to mention, Maribel, if you could put the slide up. Um, so we we one of the things we, we have uh, we're just about to roll out at the IGI is a task force to create a model steering committee charter because this is one of the the tools that you will need to build your steering committee is uh, a, a document that talks about their mandate their authority who's on it roles and responsibilities operational cadence and so on so we're going to build that. Uh, with a, a group of uh, IG practitioners uh, from our community, and just uh, release that into you know to to the community uh, you know uh, on a complimentary basis because we just think it's something that's needed to to drive maturity in this market. So uh, if you're interested in that, please contact us. Um, Ann Snyder uh, from our organization is going to drive that. You see her email address uh, there. So just flip to the last slide. Um, if you want to get more information about uh, the IGI, of course, it's there. Uh, you can see the links and so on. Or RSD, if you want to pick up the phone or visit their uh, their site. They've got some great resources around uh, IG as well. So I, I appreciate our panelists participating in this and hanging in uh, with us uh, through the sort of bleeding edge uh, aspect of it. I think it worked fairly well. Uh, any last uh, any last comments from uh, from Ed before uh, we'll start with you, Ed. Um, no, I, I, I mean I think this has been a great kind of uh, forum. I'm happy that the technology platform held up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, we we didn't hang in, we hung out, but uh, ah, that's um, right. Thanks, thanks for everyone. Rich. Uh, I would say when putting together the steering committee, make sure you got the right people uh, and the right balance of uh, functions, uh, the right amount as we talked about, and uh, as was said earlier, that uh, they have the right, let's say, power, influence, authority, and uh, control over money as well as risk if you want right. to be successful. Thanks, and thanks for uh, sharing your insight today, Rich. Sue, any uh, parting thoughts? Yeah, I'd say um, for those who are trying to uh, get a steering committee set up, there are resources out there. Uh, obviously, you guys, the IGI, uh, and your uh, your model steering committee uh, will be great. That'll be a great help. Uh, like you said, RSD has got resources out there. I would also encourage folks to reach out to the practitioners in their area or that they may have networked with at a conference to right. see what they've done to, to get help. Excellent. Bennett, final uh, thoughts? Um, just one of encouragement. You know, this is a great process. Uh, uh, um, figuring out who at your company um, is that they represent, um, becoming friends with them, figuring out what's important to them, and figuring out how to come together. Um, it's a really great endeavor for our company, and I encourage you all to do it. Excellent. Well, thanks, thanks again to all our panelists. You guys did a a great job, and I think we provided some uh, some good insight into this process. Um, uh, and thanks for our, uh, those of you that attended the live event. Uh, this will be available as a recording. We'll let you know about that, so you can come back and revisit it. And we'll also be distributing it out to a broader audience. Today, the live audience was drawn from the IGI's uh, corporate council. Uh, so thank you very much, and I hope everybody has uh, a, a great week and uh, holiday season.
Thanks. All right, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.